So I'd like to start by um, jumping right into Octavia Butler. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons that we're here today is this magnificent book that you guys have put together, um, you know, illustrated and adapted her novel, Kindred. So can one or both of you talk to us a bit about who Octavia Butler is, um, why this book is significant, right? Just mm -hmm. a little bit of background about uh, Miss Butler. Okay, you wanna start? Yes, um, some call Octavia Butler the grand dame of science fiction. Um, she was the first uh, science fiction writer to win the MacArthur Genius Grant. She's inspired a generation of science fiction and fantasy writers, uh, people like N.K. Jemisin, Nilo Hopkinson, Nnedi Okorafor, mm -hmm. and ourselves as well. Yeah. And I think to a certain degree has been unfortunately uh, unsung, you know, even though she's, she's inspired like all of these, an entire movement like Afrofuturism, yeah. black speculative art. And, um, and definitely her work in some ways I think is extremely prescient, uh, if, particularly if you look at like today's uh, political climate and some of her writings, right? Mm -hmm. um, basically thinking about the notions of uh, black femininity, um, politics, yeah. uh, hope, uh, survival, uh, her work I think is timeless and she's one of the most important writers I think to ever live. Yeah. Um, so how did you all come to this project? How did you all, how did, <laughs> how did Kindred, the, the adaptation, the graphic novel, fall into your hands? Uh, I don't know if it fell into our hands so much as we <laughs> chased after it, gave up on it, and then it sort of boomeranged back around to us. That's exactly right. Right? Um, <laughs> so it started in uh, 2009, a different publisher, not the publisher of the actual graphic novel, was uh, trying to adapt Kindred into a black and white graphic novel. Um, and I found out about it uh, online through like Publishers Weekly or something like that. Uh, but when I found out about it, it was about a week away from the deadline for a proposal. And uh, so Octavia's work really ties in well with a lot of stuff John and I have done uh, just on our own in terms of dealing with uh, issues of like uh, representation, yeah. uh, in terms of gender, race, and uh, also social justice issues informing our artwork. That's right. So it seemed like a natural progression. I was like super excited. We're both huge Butler fans. And uh, it turned out John was traveling that entire week. Talking, as, I, as I often am. Um, yeah, John, John traverses the, <laughs> the country the lands. and the world the lands. quite often. Um, but so he had various stops along his like spring break speaking tours over spring break um, week at the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like hammered out a script real quick and sent it to him. And he would draw little bits and pieces of the drawings and FedEx them back to me, like overnight them to me. Mm -hmm. I put them all together in Photoshop, like this Photoshop puzzle. And um, we just made it under the deadline, just got it done. And we totally did not get the job at all. Totally didn't get it. <laughs> totally failed. Like Huge really, failure. Well, really, it was a really a spectacular and yeah. tiring. <laughs> <laughs> a spectacular failure. I know, it was yeah. like a spectacular failure. We worked so hard to fail. It was amazing. Um, but what was really tripped out because one of the things was like, we were very excited that the, the book was going to happen. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, we still wanted to see it. I mean, I was, yeah. you know, hugely petty and jealous about whoever got the job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, yeah. you know, I pushed that down. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so three years later, uh, we, you know, kind of gone through the grieving process and moved past and mm -hmm. working on other stuff as mm -hmm. we always are. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at the San Diego Comic-Con, uh, which is, you know, giant comic convention. It's like nerdy gras. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's, we went over this yesterday. I like nerd way, prom. Fanboy pleasure zone. J yeah. Damien, Damien yeah. prefers nerd I prom. I like nerd prom. <laughs> John likes nerdy gras. Take of that what you will. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, we were, uh, and John got there a, a bit before I did. So while I was on the plane, he was walking mm -hmm. around the convention floor uh, talking to publishers. Yeah, I, I, there's several projects that we were interested in right. trying to get published by larger publishers. And I happened upon uh, Abrams Comic Arts, um, yeah. a wonderful publisher, that, and we really loved their work. And so uh, Sheila Keenan was still actually senior editor at the time. Uh -huh. And I approached her there, and I, and I showed some work on my little iPad, which right. is very useful for, for portfolios. And she says to me, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm really liking what I'm seeing. She was very complimentary. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> and uh, what was really cool though is like she said, um, I think that you'd be perfect for this project that I'm trying to get it adapted and, you know, turn into a graphic novel. And I was like, and she was like, well, have you ever heard of Octavia Butler? <laughs> 
And I was like, uh, no. Yeah, was pretty, yeah. <laughs> Who's that? You talking about the grand dame yeah. of science fiction? Yeah. Anyway, so, um, and I was like, well, what project are you trying to do? And she was like, Kindred. So wow. once I woke up from passing out, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I was like, that, that's amazing. And so Damien got there and we started discussing the possibilities. Yeah, because we met up um, at one of the hotels surrounding like the giant convention center. And uh, uh, John was there with his friend Cleve and I like found them, got at the table and he was like, oh, I did this. And I saw this famous artist and you know, stuff you do at Comic-Con. He's like, oh, and I talked to someone who uh, we might get to do Kindred. Right. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> exactly. Something like that. I, uh, and for, Right up until I was holding the book, I really thought it was this like practical. This joke. really big prank. I didn't really <laughs> wow. Know, seriously. Yeah. Um, wow. So yeah, yeah. It, was, it was wonderful. Like, Sheila Keenan was she was a wonderful uh, editor and so much an integral part of the process, which yeah. was long Very and painful. So. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which we get into. But um, yeah, so five months later, uh, we were signing contracts to do the adaptation and. Still, is very surreal because yeah. that particular book, her work, mm -hmm. um, is so important, you know. And and, and again, will really uh, gets more important every yes. gets more important day, by, in every yeah. passing day, but yes. also like significantly unsung, and I think has inspired again um, generations of writers and continually to. So, so we were hoping that this particular book would, in some way introduce people to her work a yep. lot more. That's yep. one of the main reasons. Well, we were hoping we wouldn't uh, screw up. There's also that. There's yeah. also we were hoping. <laughs> we were hoping everyone yeah. would not hate it. That Let's would not hate it. That At a very be. base level, please, we hope that you don't hate the book. <laughs> yeah, there, let's talk about that. Because she's so revered, because, you know, her fans are, are rabid. I'm one of those mm -hmm. people who are very rabid about her work. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of pressure, you know, yes. that was on you all's head to even um, take on such an endeavor, mm -hmm. you know, to adapt her work. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then this novel, too, being so, I mean, we, we know because we love her work, you know, her, her novels are very difficult, they're challenging yes. material, yeah. but this yes. one in particular, yes. due to its portrayal and its kind of delving into, you know, the peculiar institution of slavery in yes. America, right, yes. and family ties, um, it's huge, you know, mm -hmm. it's yeah. huge. I'm saying, so can you guys kind of walk us a little bit through just the process of, you know, of adapting that Adapt material, first of all, yeah. you know, yes. adapting that novel right. into graphic novel form. So this is the part where you talk about your kindred beard? Oh, my kindred beard, okay. So there's my big giant head, you're welcome. Uh, for some reason, I decided, uh, I think because I saw somebody do it during one of those like TV writer strikes, somebody was growing like a strike mm -hmm. beard or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like, until I get this draft done, I will not shave, and the itchiness will force me to finish or something. Um, I kind of lost my mind two or three times working on this, mm. <laughs> to be honest, it, because it was a lot of pressure. It was very daunting. Yeah. Um, and because uh, you know you go through a lot of uh, waiting time of, am I gonna get this contract? Is this gonna happen? Okay, I signed it, but now mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and they get to the point of like, yeah, and you're like. No, I have to do no, this. No, you have to do yep, the project. I have to do it. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I was, it was really difficult for me to cut any of the prose because it's like Octavia Butler. Yeah. You know, her like, work is so precious. I mean, it's yeah, all that she uses is very direct. And it's, yes. yes, her, yes. her prose is a very terse style, which yes. actually kind of lends itself to comics, but uh -huh. some, of the, some of the other sort of uh, time elements were difficult. But um, hmm. the most difficult, I don't know most, but initially the most difficult thing was getting over that kind of fear of, of uh, doing harm to her legacy. Her legacy, that, that yeah. was a huge problem, um, yes. And uh, so I eventually just came upon like the ripping off a Band-Aid method of it, mm -hmm. and I just wrote the worst first draft I could. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it, it was like, I put these framing sequences, and I added all these like little comics tricks and stuff, like stuff I'd you know, learned throughout the years, or yeah. stuff I'd always wanted to try in a comic. I'm like, this will all get cut out, but whatever. Just get it done. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was part of the writing process also was doing a lot of uh, doodles and sketches of uh, potential layout, page layouts. Um, and this last kind of blurry image there, I got about halfway through the novel, which is around 250, 60 pages, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And we had actually less space for the graphic novels, like 230. Wow. Um, so I got halfway through the novel, but I only had 70 pages of graphic novel left to fill. Yes. <laughs> and that's kind of a problem. Uh, so rather than going back for the umpteenth time and redoing stuff, I just drew a grid of like the 70 pages and that's what that is. Mm -hmm. And just yeah, like doodled or scribbled what has to happen on each page to get to the end. 
And yeah, uh, yeah. then sent it off to the editor, yeah. and she like brutally just it was cut beautiful. it to pieces. <laughs> I never seen so much red on one page. Wow. Well, it was like, <laughs> like wow. Well, it's like a crime scene. <laughs> yes, it was great. It was a crime scene on page. It was great. No, it was. I, she did a great job. So she cut away all the fat that was basically just my trepidation and my yeah. like hesitation marks, and uh, you know, in that mm -hmm. was the the spirit of the story, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and then John had to draw it. And right. I had to draw it, <laughs> exactly. So Ed right. is like the tag team, right? So, so at first we were working in batches, and then as far as like batches of pages, mm -hmm. and then somewhere along the lines, uh, Abrams wanted to see the entire thing sketched out. So it switched from doing full-blown drawings to these really, really uh, weird little um, thumbnail sketches. Right? Okay. So thumbnail sketched out the entire book, um, which kind of look like these things. Yeah, here. you can you see can in the screen see. there. This is me lettering the book. So after the fact, after the sketches were done, and yeah. then also after the pencils were done and the colors were done, I'd kind of redo stuff. But I, uh, I did the lettering, so the word balloons and sound effects. Um, and uh, sound effects, not too many. Um, yeah, because she, she thought they were too cartoony. They were too cartoony. She still has an issue with that. It's funny. I made that PowerPoint, and that's why I put that sound effect see in saying? there. See how you have the problem? A little bit. very happy about that <laughs> sound effect. It's fine. It's going to be okay. okay. It's going to be all right. I just reuse it for something else. I don't know why I make it. It's funny. Okay, um, but anyway, yeah, so I did that over the sketches, but I think keep going, get more process work. Yeah, so, so while uh, Damien was, was writing that horrible first draft, I was actually working <laughs> Only on... Only I get to say that. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't fight. <Sensitive. laughs> Don't so, fight. Okay, so I was actually trying to come up with the style of the book. Like, how do we actually design the characters? Um, what aspects of their personalities are going to come through? Uh, looking at, I actually went to a couple of uh, slave plantations uh, mm. to actually get a feel for the space. These mm. kind of things. Some of that, some of that work, work research actually makes its way makes its way into the um, the book. For instance, uh, the cookhouse is based off of some of the slave quarters at um, so the Whitney? Whitney is a Whitney plantation oh. near New Orleans, actually, okay. which incidentally is right next to the place where. Um, Quentin Tarantino filmed uh, oh, Django, Django oh, Unchained, yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, so that's actually, just, uh, how the house is, is there. So anyway, so these types of uh, research pieces were going into the renderings. Um, at first we were thinking about doing some like, really hyper-realistic, mm -hmm. and uh, so we actually were casting mm -hmm. characters, like so, didn't we think like, um, uh, James Franco would be uh, Rufus, would be Rufus yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah so we're just oh, thinking wow. about like what, what, what kind of characteristics they would probably have. Probably because yeah. of Spider-Man movies. Probably so. That's where yeah, we got that. But so. yeah. and, we, um, talked, we talked a little bit about uh, about Octavia kind of being da resembling a little, Dana. Yeah, we kind of were, yeah. Dana we're, we're kind of cribbing some of her for Dana, you know. And a, a lot of that comes. People keep asking about the ambiguity of her gender portrayal, right? Yes. Because in the book she gets. Um, mistaken as to, to be a, a man uh, quite often. And so yes. we're thinking about how in Octavia Butler's work, sometimes she does push back against these kind of gen gender norms yes. and like how, how, how gender presentation. roles. Presentation. Yes. and yes. representation, yeah. And so at the end of it, we decided to go with a, with a uh, more cartoony, more grotesque, more actually German in expression influenced direction for the, for the piece because yeah. of just the notion of kindred not being a science fiction uh, story, but more of a horror story. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you're a yeah. if you're currently a black person now and you get teleported into the 1800s on a slave plantation, yes. that's pretty horrible yes. <laughs> it's all, and, and terrifying. It's so, a nightmare. Yes, yeah, so a nightmare, exactly. Right. So how do, you, how do you deal with that with mm -hmm. the visual without turning people off you know, and, and making it too, too visceral? Grotesque yeah. And this is something yeah. that, that Butler uh, talked about a lot when we were reading some of these. Yeah, uh, she actually um, said in interviews about Kindred that she herself kind of, you know, cleaned up the events of slavery or made them not as terrible as they are, which if you've read the novel or the graphic novel, it's really, to believe. it's like, it's oh, so, man. Yeah, because yeah. it's already, like, very graphic. visceral, painful, yes, uh, horrifying. But she actually cleaned it up because the actual history is that much worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you guys talked, too, a bit about... Um, how how adapt how difficult it was to adapt some parts of that yes, novel. Yeah, see a lot of it, I mean, I think this is something that Damien and I talked about quite a bit, is that the the affect, the the emotional content mm -hmm. of what we were the content of the of what we were adapting, yeah. we were not ready for. It's already a, a physically cartooning yeah. is a very physical um, task. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a very unforgiving medium, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have the task of actually taking, say, a whipping scene or some kind of psychological trauma and then translating it into something that's going to be powerful, an image, yep. 
So every time you write the story, yeah. you're, you're, you're experiencing it. Every time you're sketching the story, drawing the story, inking the story, coloring it, you're making it more and more reified. You're, 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 you're tra tra traumatizing yourself over and over again. So there was one particular point uh, in the second um, chapter. chapter, The Fire, yeah. where she realizes that she's in a slave plantation and then she realizes she's time traveling. It's very real for her and she's hiding in the bushes and one of her ancestors is being whipped. Yes. And it's, it's an extreme, it was extremely emotional for me to, to, to portray that. Yeah. And then literally I weeped onto the original art. I mean, there's, even when I was coloring the, the work, I had to, I saved it for later because I was afraid of going back and experiencing that mm. again. And so I actually saved it for close to the end of the story. Yeah. But it's also like the physical nature of, yeah. of making yeah. this thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, well, I, so mostly. Well, actually, before even oh, yeah, go to ahead, that, go but going along with the, uh, the whipping scene and just the, the trauma of yeah. adaptation. Mm -hmm. See, the thing is, in that book, like, Butler's whole mission with that book is to get us to feel history mm -hmm. yes. to you know think of people in the past not as you know grainy pictures and dusty textbooks but as real people who experienced real um i mean joys but trauma yeah um and especially in that one scene that's um the first scene there's really that visceral impact on the character and also on the reader right so um it felt just doubly important to get that right. Yes. Um, because we couldn't really shy away from it or just suggest it because... Because we definitely wanted to. I'm yeah. Sorry. I didn't yeah. want... I, yeah. I, um, but the novel... You did not want to do that. You yeah. did not want to. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the novel... Demands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it demands it. Um, and we couldn't go against what the point of the book was or what right. Butler's mission was. Right. Um, so I... Just going along with discussing that sort of trauma stuff, like, we had to because that's what the book is about. Right, right. right. We talked about blood, sweat, and tears too. You know, like in a very, in a very literal way. Mm -hmm. I know that you had some issues with your sight, there, Damien. My sight. Yeah, with your with with vision, where you have like. Some oh, blood. the hallucination thing. Yeah. yeah no. Well, actually, <laughs> it happened with this. But by the time I was working on Kindred, I was used to it. This, yeah. uh, this goes back to our first graphic novel. Um, <laughs> kids, don't do comics. No. <laughs> it's dangerous, dangerous work. Uh, no, our first graphic novel we had a similar tight deadline, or although this was much tighter. And um, John was like staying up till like four in the morning drawing. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I was, I was teaching all day and I would take a nap. I would start drawing at 11 and I'd, I'd, I'd be up to like four, four. Yeah. every night. So John told me about one night he was up and he started seeing like things in his peripheral vision. It was weird, vision. it was like this black milky substance coming in from the side. Something, it's yeah. very odd. So, you know, I'm like, okay, John, whatever. Yeah, it's like very um, strange. But then once, yeah. he gets, <laughs> once he gets the art done, I have to letter, letter it. So I was lettering like 80 pages in like four days or something crazy. And I was up at like four in the morning and I had like the whole room kind of moved a little bit and uh -oh. went back. And I, rather than being like a sane person, be like, I should go to bed now. Um, but I was like, oh, that's what John was talking about. And then it's kept working. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time we got to this, like, oh, I, yeah. same Artists. stuff was happening, but I was just like, yeah, you know. Well, well, Artists and writers. Part, too, yeah. Like, like, you know, I was mostly high on Sharpies anyway. At <laughs> we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. It, was best, it was the best Yeah, because all of your inking was done with, was done with yeah, I was trying to use a medium that was expedient, that actually had a particular type of roughness to it, yeah. uh, that actually would help me to, to, there's this kind of woodcut feel to them, like, you know, the, it, it, like when you scan them mm. in and you alter them, they look really kind of grainy and, and have this beautiful kind mm. of like quality to them, but they also smell a lot. So it's funny, like it'd be like two o'clock in the morning and my wife would come into my studio and she's like, um, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. I'm totally, I'm totally fine. Oh, <laughs> so it's like, so this actually was a day's work. This is 33 pages of inked pages um, from 11 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the morning. Excuse me, 11, yeah, from 11, 11 to 3. To three. 11 to yeah. 3. In the morning, yeah. And so what would happen is I would, um, because it's faster, I draw like, these are each like 11 by 17 drawings. Yeah. So there's um, actually 760 or so original drawings um, before this book, you know. Right. So my, most, uh, if people don't know, most comics artists will draw like a full page, usually about 11, 17 size, and then re shrink it down to like the comic book size. Um, but so John actually draws each individual panel as its own large drawing and shrinks those down and composes them on the page. Which is why there's a lot of the detail. And actually what mm -hmm. I'll do is I'll take a picture of my image and email it to myself mm -hmm. on my, my trusty iPhone. Yeah. Um, I haven't used a scanner in like seven years because what happens is like when you take a picture, it's massive. It's like really big. You can size it down and you yes. get the detail. And you save the time of scanning because we're on a really tight deadline. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so, so that actually would have like, 
we could have actually missed a deadline without with, with, with using our scanner. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah. So here's mm. some of the. I'm just kind of going yeah, through some of the process. Yeah, please. Some of the process stuff. Yeah. Um, so once uh, once we finished uh, the uh, the advanced reader's copy, which was in black and white, uh, Abrams decided that they wanted to actually bind, like publish, a advanced reader's copy. They did mm -hmm. like I think two two thousand copies of a free arc for the uh, American Library Association. Right. Right. Uh, Damien and his brilliance created this um, almost like a like a like a lettering window. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's kind of a template. So um, the space between the panels, the images, is called the gutter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for this one, because I kept having to swip, swip, can't talk though, can't keep having to switch out the art from um, the early sketches to the pencil work to then the finished colors. Um, I made it so that the white space was filled in and just kind of a window was cut out. Mm -hmm. So when the art got moved in, if there were kind of um, fuzzy edges or like out coloring outside the line, it would get covered up. Right. So it wouldn't have to do any kind of post-production fixing of the art. Yeah, because you way. actually just switch, yeah. switch the art in and out. This know? is all just kind of uh, how desperation leads to... <laughs> to <laughs> it's it's the mother of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also, and also injury. Because, <laughs> and injury, at, yeah. because at the end of it, um, I, I pinched my nerve in my mm -hmm. right shoulder, and that's, that hurt really badly. Yeah. And so, as you can tell, I'm a pretty jovial person, yeah. right? I'm, look, I'm pretty jovial, right? <laughs> so, so here's the thing. There's nothing more painful and, 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 and um, I don't know, uh, uh, distressing, distressing yeah. to see a, 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 a wave, an ocean of uncolored pages. Because <laughs> I had to that color had to too. Color, yeah. I had to color. And with the deadline encroaching, and so I'm feeling the pain in my shoulder. I'm smelling the um, the poultice-like thing that's on my shoulders to stop me from, you know, uh, being in excruciating pain. And I'm I was uh, in despair. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I would, I'm not. I don't. I don't like to despair. But I was. I was. I felt really sad because I thought I was gonna let everyone down. And um, what ends up happening though, um, at the behest of Damien and some other folk, just like, dude, get someone else to help you with this color, you know, because I never use coloring assistance, right? Uh, so at the beginning, when we acknowledged uh, these five individuals, um, I was able to hire, like, you know, some coloring assistants who great. did the, the flat colors um, right. for, the, for the piece, which, let me see if I can get to those. Yeah, I like those slides a lot yeah, where you are. show the, the variation of detail. That oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah so, so the flats, you know, these were actually colored in Photoshop and uh, slipped under the, uh, the, um, the template. Yep. And so the flatters would then send me the flat colors mm -hmm. and I would uh, do the, the modeling, right? right? So I went from five pages per day to 13 to 15 pages per day, per day. and we colored over 200 and so images in about three weeks right. and met the deadline, got it in. And um, it changed the way that we thought about um, working, actually. Yes, yeah. you yeah. talked about before too about um, night and day, and the, also the little bit of tricks that you guys pulled around past and present mm -hmm. and how that related to color. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah. About yeah, your sure. treatments of color? Sure. Um, well, to start with the, uh, the time element, because normally when you have flashbacks in comics or movies, TV shows, mm -hmm. usually the past is kind of drained of color, monochrome or like sepia tone. Mm -hmm. um, sort of mimic like old printing processes or old film. Um, but we kind of wanted to flip it where the 1970s, which is, is the present day for the characters, right. um, was done in this kind of muted maroon mm -hmm. color. And then the past is uh, colored in a very um, bright, vibrant palette. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, like we talked a lot um, before we were even near that stage because it seemed right for this book because a lot of the characters talk about how the past is more vivid. vibrant, yep. vivid, yeah. real mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. Um, in part because like you're in constant danger um, even if you're not, you know, whoever you are, like if you break a leg, it's not like there's, you know, excellent medical care coming around the corner. Right. right. Um, so uh, there's a couple different characters who say everything seems soft when they get back to the present. The past seems very visceral and real. Yes. So we wanted to use the color to kind of, you know, bring that out. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, um, let me see. And again, that's the opposite of a lot of times you'll see that. He, Damien mentioned the color maroon. A lot of people read that as, as sepia. You know, but it's actually a more of a burgundy uh, mm. color because we were thinking about the color of blood and mm -hmm. you know the the actual color of blood and how these particular characters are connected genetically and through family. Because yeah. one aspect of the title is kindred and right. 
uh, or, or the idea of uh, kith and kin and, and relationships, you know, because essentially, you know, she finds that she's interacting with two sides of, you know, her, her family. Answer, of her family, yeah. right? You know? Yeah, um, which is extremely powerful. The other thing too, um, I think about some of the color palettes uh, inside during the night, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Damien told me about this uh, this film um, uh, by Stanley Kubrick called. Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon, thank you, because it was not there. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a guy's name, away. and it's like... It's yeah. a guy's name, yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, that dude Barry. Anyway, no, <laughs> right. so, so, so basically, it's set during around the same time period, and um, Kubrick, uh, he basically expressly said that he wanted to use the natural light that they would have used in that time, so it's all right. candlelight and... Um, and probably oil lamps and such. Yeah, right. natural lighting. Yeah, Otherwise, natural lighting. Yeah. And so what he did is he created a, a camera because that's what Kubrick did. He created dope cameras for, yep. for special, for crazy things. Crazy things, things exactly. <laughs> amazing films. Yes, yeah. amazing films. Are we yes. still love to this day. Yes, we do. And so what we did is um, I did a, 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 screen, a screenshot where I sampled the actual colors, the color samples. And so you see here, you can see like the ochres and the yellows. That's kind of what the lighting would look like. Right. And if you uh, look at the color wheel, um, the opposite color uh, the complementary color to, the, to that is like violets and purples. Uh -huh. So when you're outside or in this kind of nocturnal scene, you'll see like these purples. What I liked about it is that because comics are so surreal, it really plays well, I think, with the abstraction of the figure. Yes. You know? so, yeah. Yes. And then also, did you want to talk about the haint blue? Oh yeah, yes. And the other thing too, if you, if anyone's, uh, if, if, if anyone in the audience has the book. <laughs> um, there's this, this color, this, this kind of turquoise, like this light turquoise color. Um, the Gullah people from, San, uh, from uh, South Carolina believe that if you painted um, houses or doors uh, with this color, which they call haint blue, haint is a spirit or a ghost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That it would attract the spirits to it. They would think it's the sky and it'd fly into it and protect you, right? Oh. So we like this idea of Dana haunting her own existence or, or haunting her own past, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. It, it's kind of like a co haunt. Like she's haunting her own past and then her past comes back and haunts and haunting her. her. Haunting yeah. her. Well, yeah, because this notion of the Gothic is something that's really present yes. in the story. I mean, you see the trope of, you know, uh, body horror, mm -hmm. uh, fake artifacts, yep. the doppelganger. Yep. And the Natural world, of, mimicking, emotional world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. See, these are all mm -hmm. Gothic tropes that, are, that you find in. Kindred that we wanted to kind of pull out a lot more. Yes. You know, so. I like that you guys are geeking out so hard. Are you guys still with us? Okay, because oh, you know, I, can, can, I can do this all day. There are people here. I'm I can do it all day. You did what? Yeah. So I'm glad that you guys are hanging in there with us. Thank you. There's people out there. Hi. I know. Hi, guys. You're Sorry. there. Um, Fantastic. So I want to talk very quickly because I know our time is is um, is going to get away from us. I want to talk about some of your past work because okay. oh, okay. you all you know you all have had a working relationship prior to having done this project, Kendra, right. that we're here to talk about today. But you all have a great deal of work that you already have done together, mm -hmm. um, J2D2, <laughs> and um, then I also want to talk about what's coming up. Okay. okay. What's the future projects looking like? Well, see, um, so Damien and I have been working together for about 12 years, yeah. um, and we're both comic scholars, uh, massive lovers of uh, educational comics and different ways to use comics uh, outside of just uh, the mainstream, yeah. what, was, what was perceived to be uh, the medium of comics. So we were always drawn to comics in fine art spheres, comics uh, in educational spheres, not just like comics that are specifically like, here's how you do a math problem, but also using <laughs> comics like Kindred to, mm -hmm. you know, bring about productive pedagogical conversations. Yeah. Or, or to deal um, directly with social justice issues yes. of various backgrounds. And so um, we met um, when I brought uh, Scott McCloud, who's like the Marshall McLuhan of comics, to, to U of I. Uh, Damien crashed our dinner party. Yes. I think our dinner. Well, it, and like a friend <laughs> well, of a double. friend of a friend was like, just come in with us. I'm like, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> So remember to break into places. That's how you get places. <laughs> a lot of life that's lessons how you get today. Things. A lot of life lessons. Crash parties. But, but what, yeah, we started talking. We found out we um, had very similar political interests, very similar artistic interests. Mm -hmm. uh, really loved this idea of pushing comics past traditional um, sort of pop culture boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm talking bo both content-wise and also formally too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we ended up, um, yeah, making comics, mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, our, I, I don't even, like our first graphic novel is called The Whole Consumer Culture. Right. It is, see if I can do it again. Uh-oh. I used to have this totally memorized. It pitch, it's this. like a, 
Science fiction horror satire of the buying and selling of race and gender in America and the bloody horror of boundaries being torn down. You yes. did it. Is wow. that it? Something like that? I know. What? Thank you. Good night. <laughs> that was really one. I can't top that. Um, <laughs> so we did that. Um, but that was actually a book. It was also made to be taught. Um, so we, yeah. there's a contextualizing essay, bibliography. Yeah, it's like projects uh, you can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, so, okay. And it's funny because it actually ended up being taught. <laughs> yeah. And so we figured out, like, so, so it was being taught at Vassar in two classes. Oh, and they right. brought us in and we did an art show there. Yeah. And we realized then, I think, it was, that was two years ago. That was like we had been working together tw uh, like ten, 10 years, years at the time. At the time. Yeah. Wow. I had to check with my wife because she keeps my, like, brain, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, wait, you were yeah, living here. your brain? Then, yeah. Mm -hmm. You were living it's here good. and we did that. Yeah, it was like 10 years, so. But it was, Good. But there's also a couple of um, uh, art shows that we curated uh, mm -hmm. that were in response to um, the uh, Ameri Masters of American, Master of American Comics, Comics show yeah. that was in 2005. Uh, it was from generated in Los Angeles and um, UCLA the, Hammer Museum. That's right. Um, who's the Art Spiegelman? And I forget the other curator's name. But I forgot the other name too. I'm sorry. You know, we can, like, maybe we can like voice over it and so it basically featured like 15 of the greatest cartoonists to ever live right according to right. their particular uh, rubric right? right and the first thing we noticed were there were no women in it at all so women can't be masters of American comics obviously and uh, <laughs> and then we started looking at other discrepancies around like what types of comics were being shown and so yeah. and it seemed like it was a kind of a narrow view yep. of how and so we actually created a show uh, called Out of Sequence. It was meant to be kind of the opposite, the opposite. exploded view. Um, yeah. hmm. So showing, uh, it was called Out of Sequence, Underrepresented Voices in American Comics. Yeah. Right. And we took underrepresented to mean both, like in a demographic sense, so right. uh, women creators, gay and lesbian creators, uh, minority creators, mm -hmm. all that. And then um, also underrepresented in terms of formally. Formally, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we had like, Experimental comics. Gallery like, comics. Yeah, comics made just for museum settings. Huh. Um, abstract comics. Abstract comics, mm -hmm. which are what they sound like, believe me. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's 241 you know, pieces. 241 pieces. We had like this folding, folding accordion comic. But yeah, it's pretty yeah. wild. And you can actually yeah. still see that the catalog is still available. And there's like a video one. online somewhere you can kind of and see. And what's the name of that project? Out of sequence. Out of sequence. Out of sequence. Yeah, Out of that, sequence. it was at the Craner Art Museum. Okay. In, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, where uh, John and I met, John Todd, I still teach. Right. And, and so that's fun, fun in the projects like the uh, Black Comics uh, Collection um, that was published through Mark Batty Publisher in what, mm. 2010? 10, yeah. Um, and so it dealt with some of the um, black independent comics publishers that a lot of people don't know about. It's 56 uh, um, uh, artists and publishers in there. Right. And um, unfortunately, Mark Batty went out of business and the book went out of print. and so. I was actually, uh, actually had a copy of the book at a comic book store and I showed it to the guy who ran the place, uh, David Dasanyake. And uh, it turns out that um, he was a marketing director for, for Magnetic uh, Press. Magnetic <laughs> Press, which is based in Chicago. Um, wow. Yeah, so they, they kind of talked us into doing a sequel to this Black Comics art book we did. Um, well, because we had talked about doing a reprint, but things had, like, there were so many more artists. Things mm -hmm. that expanded. They yeah, expanded. yeah, so well, many more so many other projects too though. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, some of which we found it, you know. Right. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, so there's a, there's a really strong like under, kind of uh, underrepresented um, black comic book culture that's mm -hmm. been around since the, since the mid 90s, you mm -hmm. know, that we've been a part of and have been cataloging and trying to push forward. So right. the second book just got a nice Kickstarter. Yeah, we're working on finishing up the production on that right now. When um, will we be able to see that? When, when are you all, what's the projected? Uh, it's supposed date? to come out in September, I believe. Okay. Um, it's gonna be solicited in comic shops in May is the plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's now coming out from Lion Forge Comics who bought Magnetic and Magnetic's now an imprint under Lion Forge. <laughs> Um, and yeah. Yeah, and um, currently we are also... Oh, it's called Black Comics Returns. Black Comics Returns, okay. yeah. It's like Son of Black Comics was not... No, that was, well, that was too gendered. Son of Black Comics? Yeah, yeah. yeah. too yeah, gendered. Yeah. That's why, no, it's called oh. Black Comics Returns. That's U.N. That's U.N. I mean, it's a little better. Oh, <laughs> I get it. It's actually called Black Comics Returns. Oh. He's just trying to confuse okay. us all. I know, I'm just being silly. <laughs> so the other thing, too, um, a project they're working on right now diligently is mm -hmm. um, from Lee and Low Press. Uh, it's written by Tony Medina. Uh, we are on the, on the production team for this piece. Yep. Um, 
it's a kind of a Black Lives Matter ghost story. It's called I Am Alfonso Jones. Yep. Our partner and friend, um, Stacy Robinson, is the penciler. Okay. And um, we have a team of inkers and trying to get that out, and it will be out in fall. Okay. Yes. So it's a graphic novel. Yeah. And, and I'm lettering. He's lettering, and I'm, I'm doing some production management and, and finishes. So. And then uh, there's Kid Code, is another comic that we're. Now, Kid Co. was something that you all did Well, before. we did the first issue, okay. uh, also with Stacy, And then the second issue is maybe a little bit overdue. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stacy, if audience. you see this recording, uh, you better be drawing. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. so we don't want to go to do yeah, time is, it's, it's a time travel story. Time is relative. It's Actually, fine. it's a time travel, it's a hip-hop time travel story. It's yeah. about, it's, it's anti-capitalist narrative uh, for, what, it's a YA audience. It's like Doctor Who meets superheroes meets... Africa Mambada. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Like yeah. you do. Of course. Yeah. Um, I would be getting advanced copies of all of these. <laughs> <laughs> Just letting you guys know. Yeah. Right. Um, I'll be looking for those in my mailbox yeah, we'll immediately. Okay. 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 I see the hint there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is there, are there any last words that you guys want to wanna put out as far as, oh, the, well, let's talk very quickly about this before we open it up oh, to the yeah. audience to ask us some questions. Can we about this celebrate this? Oh, yes. Yeah. This is one of my favorite screenshots because this is, I took this screenshot when the entire black and white images were done. And I did like a little, little dance. You know, even though my shoulder was jacked up, it was still, it, <laughs> it was, was still great to see that. Strange you know? dance. Yeah, <laughs> An yeah, awkward yeah. dance. Yeah, 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 exactly. I was a little off center. <laughs> But yeah, See, I, just, I just do awkward dances without any excuse. without any problem. Yeah, me too. But the thing yeah. was, it's like it was at this particular point. I mean, essentially, the without it's not colored, but the mm -hmm. but the but the actual adaptation, the actual work to 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 put pen to paper and make these images come to life is done. Yeah, you know, and yeah. uh, it was a, it was an amazing feeling, and um, holding the book uh, once it was done. Oh yeah, no, once I got the actual copy, I mean. I might have cried. I don't know. I was just like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I might have slept with it. I'm not saying for off. sure. Yeah, but, yeah. Kind of crazy. But, um, I was kind of like, I wish this was soft cover, but it's okay. <laughs> there will be a soft cover, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So, I do. I do want to just say one thing before um, we open it up to. I just want to congratulate you all. Thank you publicly. Thank you. Thank um, you. Give him a round of applause, any please. Um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful adaptation. Thank you. Of Thank her you work. very much. And um, I had a, you know, I raced through it, read mm. it in like two days, and it wow. was just, you know, a pleasure to just really, and not to have this backstory about how it came to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very significant, wonderful. It's so high thank praise. you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, yeah, thank you. Seriously, thank you. So let's open it up um, to our audience and get some questions going for. <laughs> Damien and John, those of you who have questions about any of the things that were brought to the table this afternoon. Hey, I was just wondering if there was any uh, variant covers that you were looking at and huh. why you settled on the one that you chose. Interesting, that's a great question, actually. Um, you want to talk about the covers that we Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's um, actually, uh, all right, on my website, it's just DamienDuffy.net, um, I did a bunch of blog posts about the process, so you can actually see some earlier cover designs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it was mostly like the current cover for the paperback of the novel we don't like. <laughs> um, Sorry. Because it's, it's just like a photo, well, there's a couple. One's a photo of a woman kind of over a house. One's a photo of a woman in a field. Hmm. And we felt like neither of those really, like they kind of give away some of the story, but don't actually, like it looks like it's a romance novel or something, which mm -hmm. is not. I mean, maybe in a really twisted way it's a romance a story. Twi but very twisted. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, both of us liked some of the more abstract cover designs uh, we had seen on the novels. Um, so we kind of took our cues from that. Um, mm -hmm including uh, there's one where it's like just kind of two profiles with a... It was at the beginning. Yeah. It was, it was illustrated. Illustrated and it has like an hourglass. Kind of like an hourglass. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, that's uh, how we ended up with the um, infinity symbol manacles. We wanted like that kind of time element. Yeah, because we actually wanted to feel, feel like how do you show this type of uh, the speculative nature, mm -hmm. you know, through it without giving too much away to actually talk about some of the issues in the, in, in the comedy. That's where you have like the... The, the grabbing of the arm, which right. of course is you know, part of the story. And uh, like you said, the manacle, the infinity man manacle, mm. 
Uh, but it, yeah. but it, we went through not a lot of iterations. It came pretty quickly. We had to get the cover done fast because, of course, you have to get the cover done to promote the book and what have you. So yeah, for the for the catalog and such. Also, yeah. I mm. I had a the first Butler book I ever read. I was a sophomore in college, and it was Kindred. And um, a professor just suggested it, like a creative writing professor, because I'd written something in first person, and she was like, you need to check this out. Oh. Um, but I got one of the older editions with the old cover, which gave nothing away, so I went into the novel not knowing anything about wow. it. Wow. Which is, it's actually <laughs> written where you don't realize Dana is black for like the first Until 30 pages. Oh. And it's right when Rufus drops his first end bomb and then says, you're on a plantation. Got Which it. is really interesting because you don't really understand what the stakes of the story are until that until moment. Until then. And that's yeah. right when Dana also figures out what the stakes are. And that's when it becomes a horror story. And that's when, it yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It, it was, I, I tend to read kind of slow. It was one of the few novels I just like read straight through. Because yeah. after that, I was like, oh, this is what this is about. <laughs> oh my God. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we felt like we wanted a cover that did something like that. Drew you in, but didn't give too much away. Or, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because there was one really great review that actually reviewed the cover which I thought was, oh, cool. wow. I forgot which one it was, but I was really, um, you know, taken by that. So thank you for your question. Um, so first of all, I'm eating this up. This is very adorable. Like your chemistry is really uh, fun. <laughs> Who um, needs to? Yeah, it's I mean, cute. I'll you. it's very cute. I like to get in on it a little bit. <laughs> um, and it brings a lot of joy to a, like a really tough, like it, it makes the legacy like really joyful. Thank but you. that's also, what I'm curious about, uh, we talked, like at the beginning you talked about how, the awesome kind of responsibility, and I'm wondering like what diligence like looked like for you, like was there conflict or, or were there people that you were talking to to make sure that this is like the best adaptation it could be? That's yes. a great question. Um, so <clears throat> we of course did a lot of research on the story itself uh, through interviews and, and the like, yeah. but we're also are fortunate to know some very talented speculative uh, writers. Um, contemporary. Yeah. Contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mostly. who are friends of and mentored by Octavia Butler. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, women of color and um, mostly. And we were sending out pieces of writing, we were sending out even some of the lettering, I believe, too. Yeah. And, yeah. I had a couple, like, really brief but really helpful conversations with uh, Nettie Okorafor, who wrote the introduction, yes. and uh, Nala Hopkinson. And it was, it was mostly, they were like, it's okay, you can do this, like, right. we believe in you, so. Yeah, and, and that was actually very helpful, because again, this is a space that is not necessarily, it's, is our space, but also isn't, and we wanted to make sure that this particular narrative was um, as close to what uh, Octavia Butler wanted and, and, and talked about in yeah. the interviews that she had done. Uh, for instance, uh, her references, referencing it as a grim fantasy, for instance, you know, how she was looking at the, um, the real life legacies of slavery and how they affect us now. The notion of the cyclical nature of history, right? This is something that was really important. And um, yeah, it, it, was, it was definitely a lot of pressure. I mean, Damien actually talks sometimes about her, her, her presence being in the room yeah, with her. Yeah, I was always worried her spirit was like over my shoulder, like no white boys. <laughs> <laughs> just stop. You know, you know just stop, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so we were very serious about we were just, we were, no, I'm sorry. We we're very serious about it. I mean, it's um, the, the, the overtones, and, uh, and we, we put in a lot of time into character designs and thinking about what was necessary to make it as close as possible to yeah. and also, the uh, story. And also, working with our editor, Sheila Keenan, was hugely helpful. Phenomenal. I mean, she, she played a, a major role in making sure we were always, like, on mess, not on message, but like keeping true to the spirit of the novel. But also yeah. bringing what you're talking about, that joy to it. At the end of every email, what was it? Onward. Onward, that's Onward. right. At the end of every that's email, right. onward. Yeah. That was so helpful. Yes. You know, because it, it was it's heavy. It's heavy. Yeah. It's heavy. It's a daunting project. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of, of alternative comics, and I say alternative being outside of Marvel, DC, that's right. image. Sure. And I'm wondering, considering the gravity of these kinds of stories, Mm. and considering how important they are and how well received these things are, why do you think those big three aren't touching stuff like this? You That's want me a to tough question. You can start? start. You start. Okay. What was it? I didn't hear his <laughs> he's like, why, He's like basically looking at how important these particular issues are and how sure. comics are, can deal with those. Why aren't the big comics like Marvel DC dealing with it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, so my usual thing is that Marvel and DC aren't really even comic book companies anymore. You know, yeah. they're, they're corporate IP farms. Yep. Um, 
I just that's what they're for. That's what they are. Sorry. Um, and I mean, we know people who work uh, for them, and I mean, you know, I'll still read some of those comics and enjoy them, but they don't. They're not made to deal with any kind of. I don't want to be like all superheroes are bad because there are good superhero stories, but by and large, they're mostly just for a small profit and otherwise to help the corporate brand overall. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, there isn't really room there for nuance a lot of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, th I mean, I think that's part of it. The other thing that, so I was at a book fair recently um, and there was a you know a panel just talking about comics in general mm -hmm. and it came down to this Marvel DC discussion, why don't they, you know, why aren't they more serious about uh, portraying diversity, having stronger female characters, and, and so forth? Um, and I was sitting back there like, like that's, they don't matter. They don't, that's not <laughs> um, right. Because uh, the top, does anyone know what the top selling uh, graphic novelist comics person is anywhere? Does anybody uh, know who that is? Uh, so Pop Raina, quiz. No, I didn't know. Like, uh, Raina Telemeyer. I hope I said her name right. Yeah, Telemeyer. <clears throat> Um, but she's done his books like Smile, Drama, Sisters, uh, a couple others. But like she outsells all the Marvel comics. Every. And she just does books for like uh, tween girls, like teenage girls mm -hmm. mostly. Like that's the main demographic. Right. And she sells like a gajillion copies. But it's, it doesn't really fit into uh, that common American discussion of comics as basically Marvel and DC, That's right. superheroes, movie adaptations, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so in all these discussions, I always end up saying there isn't a comics industry, but multiple industries mm. where comics exist. Right, that's true. I mean, just to kind of put it in perspective, I mean, if you look at like the American booksellers list, um, the top, out of the top five, four of them are her books. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So <laughs> and that's not four. even, right. in, the, in the 90s in comics culture, um, there was always this myth of, well, girls don't read comics. And it was like, no, girls don't read your Real comics. comics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's really tripped out, too, is like, you know, um, now with, with access to different types of publishing, uh, yep. you know, technologies and the World Wide Web, you don't necessarily need to work in those spaces either. That's what, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think that that particular uh, genre is not necessarily made for the types of issues that we're trying to talk about. We're talking about a, a genre, the superhero genre that was created in the late 30s. Right. You know? And how, do you, how does it change? It's, not, it's meant to not change. And, to, and sometimes being large and, and being institutional limits you greatly, I think, because we're talking about like the idea of the, 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 the steamboat, excuse me, the, the steamship and the, um, and the uh, what's, the, what's the other little thing? The, the, the rowboat? The, not the rowboat. Jet ski? Jet ski. Something uh, faster. Something and, faster and jet ski? You know what I'm trying to say. Okay. <laughs> Hoverboard? Kind of Hoverboard? No. It doesn't work on water. Um. Basically, being <laughs> smaller is better, I think. Sometimes we deal with these issues, oh, right? God. Because of the weight of, of an entire well, institution. It's, yeah, it's just a different model. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. because uh, Marvel and DC is work for hire. It's the brand leads the way. Corporations are people, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, like with Abrams, we've been lucky that, uh, well, our, ours is a little different because we're dealing with Abrams um, and the Butler estate through Abrams, but uh, in general, they have more of a book publisher model where they cultivate a relationship with an author, right? Yes. Um, so even that, that business model is different. Very right? much so. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Speedboat. Is that oh, what you're trying okay, to do? Okay. Oh. There That's it is. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah, See, so Jessica smaller and more maneuverable. There it That's is. That's a good point. Okay. Though. Mm. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question. When you're thinking about comic books as um, compared to films or written novels, mm -hmm. um, how do you think that, or what, what, what do you think is unique about that medium mm -hmm. for both the audience and the creators? Mm. That's a good question. That's a, that is a great question because yeah. I think. Um, yeah, thinking about, you guys talked yesterday a little bit about um, just this new audience that is now introduced to this novel, mm -hmm. right? And to Octavia, to Ms. Butler, through, you know, this the medium, medium right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, so that's one thing, too. Just kind of thinking about the previous question. Um, superhero comics or mainstream comics have actually uh, caused this, um, this weird illusion 
uh, or this conflation uh, of genre and medium, you know? And so when you think about the medium of comics, you know, we're also thinking about a, um, a history that goes back to say even stuff like the Bayou Tapestry or right. hieroglyphics or different types of, of visual reading. And it's interesting too when you think about like um, comics and uh, literacy, you know, how, how they did with literacy in a particular way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the fact that they were so ubiquitous at one particular point, you know, I think is really interesting too. Uh, comics, I think, are a great way to speak symbolically and metaphorically. Um, they're a great way to introduce a lot of really complex subjects yep. uh, through that type of inherent surreal nature of, of, of the medium, you yeah. know? And they just, um, they elicit a different type of interaction with the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and not like different in like a better, like one way is better than the others, mm -hmm. although I'll say better, because I do comics, so it must be <laughs> um, But, you know, like, uh, because in f there's a the whole thing of film and time, and time is just time in film, right? It's a, right. a time-based medium or television. Um, and then comics kind of falls in between film and prose in that you read the images, and you as the reader control the passage of time from mm -hmm. one, one image to the next. So that just, in and of itself, elicits a very different kind of, of reading. Mm -hmm. And there's, like, a long history um, especially in the U.S., of uh, comics being thought of as sort of um, uh, like lesser prose literacy, right? right? Like you use that as a gateway and then get the kids reading real books. Yeah, yes. real books. Yeah, exactly. but <laughs> it's, it's actually, um, and nowadays actually, it's more like you use the comics to get the kids to read more critically digital media, mm -hmm. right? right? But I mean, yeah. really comics itself is its own unique form of reading. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, especially in terms of, of Kindred, we tried really hard to do things comics do best. Um, so there was like a reason to adapt it right. beyond just like, you know, kids might like this. Um, right. So, you know, like we replaced certain, it, it, comics is a little more flexible where like you can, we put a map of the plantation in the book rather right. than like a bunch of description of the plantation. Um, so you can sort of jump around different visual vocabularies but integrate them in a way. Right. Um, and that, I think was, was an important part of adapting it and something we tried to uh, bring to the fore. Yeah. You guys are, uh, um, just very quickly for the teachers um, and the educators in the room, there's going to be a, mm. a guide, right? That's coming it's already, forth. No, it's already. It's already. Yeah, the teacher's yep. guide is free, right? Yeah, it's free. Um, you can find it, I believe, on the Abrams website. Uh, the subpage, like for the book Kindred, there's also a link to a free teacher's guide mm -hmm. by. Professor Regina Bradley. Yes, who is a professor of English and African American Studies at Kennesaw State University. Great. Yep. What are your thoughts about uh, writers who are known for their critiques of society and social structures entering into a more traditional comic book world? And I'm mm. thinking of Ta-Nehisi Coates and yeah. Roxane Gay. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's funny, we were just talking, we're about, kind of talking about that yesterday, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, um, we might we, phrase this a little differently yeah, 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 than yeah, we did we yesterday. Were, yeah. um, <laughs> they are, I mean, uh, both of the authors you mentioned are clearly genius, Phen yeah. phenomenal, geniuses, yes. amazing authors. Yes. Um, there is a sense in reading those works, uh, of what I've read of those works, like there are some growing pains maybe involved. Like I feel like they're still figuring out how to write for comics, mm -hmm. um, and so what John and I were talking about yesterday, uh, we were just sort of wondering, like, aren't there, aren't there actual comics, right? Like, you know, women of color, uh, men of color, just, you know, more socially active comics writers mm -hmm. who, could also, who could maybe fill those spaces in a different way. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, part of it might be, too, writers who operate in the independent scene often have no interest in writing like Black Panther or whatever. Right. But, yeah, I don't know. I, it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. It's, it's a great question. It is a great question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I think... You troubled the waters with that one. Well, no, well, I, I, just, I, I don't want to sound like I'm like, you know, novel writers shouldn't do... Like, of right, course yeah. they should. Of course please, they should, but, of course. But it is a, it's a specialty, though. It is, yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything else. It's a specific kind of writing. It's a different, that, yeah, thank yeah. you. you yeah, it's, it's a different, different kind of craft. craft. It's a specific yes. kind of craft. Well, just like the same type of thing is like there's a certain amount of literacy to the, to the writing. If you're not right. used to writing, and we're dealing with that with other books that we worked on too. Sure. Where if you're not used to writing in that space, um, 
there, like you said, there's growing pains. There's a different way of thinking about how text uh, gets across information and how the fusion with text and image gets across information. Yeah. Um, definitely more people should be making comics. This actually is the comics industry's fault. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because a lot of times, um, well, first thing is that uh, because of the, the self, um, uh, self-censorship, you know, for so long, you know, we actually, uh, of, of comics to the, to the comics code, uh, we actually pulled comics off the streets and put them into the, and they ended up in these like smaller dens. Right? Yeah, kind of insular comic shop market. Uh, and, and so, there, this is going to be, this is like a deep dive in comics history, I don't know. Just a little bit. Okay, just you keep going. Okay. You know what, <laughs> what I'm going to say though is that, you know, um, in other countries, uh, comics as a medium are, are more celebrated. And so this idea of like tricking people into reading real comics or, mm. or um, thinking about them a way to, to, to make films and things of that nature, they celebrate them as, as, an, a, you know, as an actual medium. In France, they have over 400 uh, comics festivals. Oh, wow. You do know that? They call it the ninth art, the ninth art. Mm. One of them is ballet. I'm just kidding. No, it's dance. Dance, yeah, it's yeah, like prose. Yeah, 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 yeah prose. Anyway, so yeah, but so so what I'm saying is like this notion of like switching between authorship and, and which particular types of mediums. Um, I think more people should should definitely read them and make them. Um, but I, yeah, I kind of feel like part of it too is I wish if Tana Hussey Coast was going to write a comic, I wish he'd write his own comic. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I'm like I don't know if I don't know if he's necessarily who I want. Like, I would rather see a Ta Coates a comic. created original comic. That he original. did with, like, Brian Stelfreeze. Yes. Who drew the Black Panther comic as an amazing artist. But I'm like, what could they do together if they just sort of were let allow... Yeah, they yeah. weren't tied to any kind of movie franchise. And would they, like, for, I actually ask questions, like, for instance, would, there, would these comic books exist if the Black Panther movie wasn't about to come out? Mm. You know, because, again, these pamphlet comics which is what they are, these monthly comics, they are uh, promotional, promotional in nature, right? And as well written and as beautiful as some of these particular uh, projects are, they are a, um, a small uh, contingent part of a larger multinational corporation. Right. You know, the mouse, the mouse owns Black Panther, Disney. Yeah, right? I and thought you were like, like mouse, like our the mouse. I was like, mouse, the graphic novel? Don't say, don't say Mickey or they'll yeah. sue us. I said it, I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus. Um, okay. <laughs> also, I, part of this too is the nature of the comics industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Also, I, part of this too is the nature of comics is always, like its meaning is always kind of in flux. Like um, the author Samuel Delaney mm -hmm. described mm -hmm. comics as a social object. So a lot of what, you know, at the answer to the question, what is comics, is very bound up in who is talking, asking that question, who is answering that question. And I think that's some of my hesitation or, um, with, or why I'm not totally satisfied with like ta Coates and Roxane Gay's work and the Black Panther stuff is that it feels like there's some kind of like disconnect, cultural disconnect there, mm. where it's just like, oh yeah, I'll do this thing and then I'll get back to my, my mm -hmm. more serious work or something, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, I don't know, because I mean, like, again, I would love for every author to do multiple things, but maybe just do it under their own terms or something, I don't know. Right. And there you have it. A can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? How am I supposed to fish with those? Oh, no. I don't know. A can of worms you just opened up. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Can we give you. this gentleman a round of applause? Thank you.